be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, whose coming judgment will shake the earth and heaven, just as in the advent of Christ you overturned all images of earthly power, prepare us for that awesome day when the Son of Man will appear in glory. Shape our lives according to his teaching that what we do for the least of his brothers and sisters we shall have done for him, the same Jesus Christ, who is, who was, and who is to come, and lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the watercourses, and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, but the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you pushed the flank with flank and shoulder and butted at all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide, I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be ravaged, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God and my servant David shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray the psalm by the half first, dividing at the asterisks. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us, and we are his. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting. And his faithfulness endures from age to age. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and you, your love towards all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, 
which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The word of the Lord. <clears throat> the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Lord, to you, Lord, to you. Jesus said, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. <clears throat> and he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you for the from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. <clears throat> then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. <clears throat> In 1925, the Bishop of Rome, Pius XI, established the Feast of Christ the King as a way of asserting against the fascism that was growing in Italy and Spain and Germany and also communism in Russia and many of the lands around it that there was really only one true king for the world, only one true leader who was trustworthy and true, and that that was Jesus Christ, and that no matter what any earthly power was promising, or no matter what they were menacing towards their own people or others, that they could certainly turn to Christ, to hope in him, and to follow his way that would bring ultimately a kingdom of truth and right, of holiness and grace, of justice and love and peace into the world. Needless to say, it was largely ignored. The Catholic Church had it for a number of years and then after the Second Vatican Council when other churches of a liturgical nature decided to reform their liturgy 
in much the same way that the Roman Catholic Church did, this Feast of Christ the King became uh, fixed on the last Sunday before Advent. In other words, all of the liturgical year, beginning with Advent and the contemplation, first of all, of Christ coming again, and then moving towards the first coming, and then through the mysteries of the Incarnation, and then of Epiphany, and then through Lent and Easter, and finally to Pentecost, and then the long, se the long season following Pentecost, was a, to reach this high point, this crescendo to the point where Jesus is all in all, as St. Paul says at the end of the second lesson today. And so that's really what we attempt to proclaim and celebrate today, why the scripture readings go in the direction that they do, because we're trying to make the statement that with all that we believe and all that we celebrate during the year, with all the other kinds of things that go on in our daily lives and in the world around us, still the truth is that Christ is the King. Christ is our leader. Christ's way is ultimately the way to peace, to love, to joy, to salvation, and that there is no one else and there is no other system that can promise that to us in any kind of way that ultimately will satisfy the desires of the human heart. And that's really ultimately what it's about. Because God is the only one that can fill the heart of man or woman. The only one who can make us truly what it was that we were created and called to be from the beginning. Now what Ezekiel says in the first reading today is addressed to the people when they have returned from exile. They come back, they see a disaster around them, but they begin to put life back together. But as they do so, they start to fall back into old patterns from the past. Their old patterns of injustice, especially towards the poor and those that were not considered the best or the brightest. Their leaders, many times seeking alliances with nations that would eventually lead the people astray. And so they were being questioned by Yahweh and the prophets, principally here at Ezekiel, but also Isaiah and also Jeremiah and even some of the other minor prophets. They were bringing up so many different things that caught the people up short, or they called them sh up short, from the way they should have been living, and how certain people were getting rich, but the vast majority were getting poorer. Those who really were in need continued to be in need, and the rest were suffering. And so God finally tells them, I have had enough of your leaders. I have had enough of these people who are those on who are following on David's throne because no one except for maybe one king since the time of David has done anything anywhere near what was pleasing to me, to my will, that did what I wanted them to do. Almost everyone else has led the people astray. That's why I now have decided that I am going to pasture my sheep. No more king is going to pasture the sheep. I'm going to pasture the sheep. 
and the one that I will put on the throne of David will ultimately be the shepherd for these people. And so what's being reinforced there is the original promise made to the people, made to David by the prophet Samuel in the second book of Samuel chapter 7 verse 14 when he says that there will always be a descendant of David on the throne of Israel. The people were only too aware that their kings had been disastrous and that God was sick and tired of dealing with them and so there was no plan for succession. And so God is the one who says, I'm going to take care of this myself. And so it's fulfilled in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because as we'll hear when we move into Advent, that this is the fulfillment of what God had promised. That Jesus is the one who reigns eternally. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Jesus is the one who reigns eternally, who is eternally on the throne of David to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. He's the one who fulfills this promise and will never desert the flock, will never aggrandize himself at their expense. Because what the prophet is saying here is that, you know, I'm going to discriminate between the fat and the sleek sheep. And what he's talking about there are those who have grown lazy and fat as opposed to those who are living hand to mouth. Whomever some of the court prophets were or their leaders or the other leaders among them who on the backs of the regular people had made themselves into something spectacular in their own eyes. No more of that, he says. And that's why, you know, he says, I will take them, I'll put them in a good pasture, and, um, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. So when Jesus tells the story in the gospel today, it's really the ultimate fulfillment in word of what Jesus is going to fulfill in action in very short amount of time. Because he says, as often as you did it for one of the least of my brothers or sisters, you did this to me. You fed me, you clothed me, you visited me, you welcomed me, you did all of these things. So you were doing this for me. And when you refuse to do this, you refuse to do it to me. And so he's making it, it very plain that it's not just in words that the Lord expects his people to follow him, but it's ultimately in deeds. And that Jesus is judging what's going to be done by those who claim his name, who claim to be faithful. What are we doing? What have we done? What will we do? Because it's not just to profess the right thing. It's to do the right thing. And it's difficult in our world at times to decide what the right thing is to do. Should we give money to these people because they don't have food or clothing or shelter? and without a, any kind of guarantee that if I give them this amount of money that they're not just going to squander it on something else? Or if we reach out to this particular group of people, are they going to 
ultimately abuse this system that we have asked them to enter into just to give, get one up on somebody else. Those kinds of things happen. Human beings are human beings. Some people who live hand to mouth have adapted a way of living that lets that continue for them even if it means that somebody like them is cheated out of something. And our place is not to judge that, but to continue to make it possible that the least of these are fed, are clothed, are housed, are given to drink, and are protected one way or another. And that we, who have, need to continue to learn how to give of what we have because of why it has been entrusted to us in the first place. Because this is how the Lord chooses to continue to govern the flock that has been entrusted to us. That all of us together are entrusted with people that we need to care about. Those of our parish and those in our community, those that we can help directly and those that we help indirectly. But we can never rest on our laurels and say, we've done everything that we possibly can do. Because there are always people in need. There are always ways that the Lord is calling us not to become fat, not to become complacent, but to continue to be truly the sheep of his pasture, those who understand that he ultimately is the shepherd who is never going to mislead us or take us somewhere where we should not be. If the Lord calls this parish, for example, to be particularly mindful of the homeless, just as an example, and we come up with 50 different excuses of why we shouldn't do that, then we're not doing what he calls us to do. Our shepherd will call us up short. He'll wonder if we really want to be the richest people in the cemetery someday. Do we want to have the biggest bank account in the deanery or the diocese? And there are other parishes that have to face this kind of thing too. But the most important thing for us, my brothers and sisters, is to remember that, you know, St. Paul in the second lesson says today, I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. And he goes on to say something here so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe. He's telling us that it's the Lord who enables us, empowers us to do the work that he has commended us to do. To take care of the flock that's been entrusted to us. That all of us, no matter who we are, no matter how little we have or how much we have, are called to serve those who are most in need. And in that way, we're living out the ministry of our King, of the one who calls us, who leads us, who guides us, and who ultimately shows us that by his own emptying, he has filled us by his own giving of himself on the cross. He enables you and me to live as the living members of his body that we are by baptism 
in the here and now. And that what we do, what we say, touches the lives of people in the here and now with the love and the mercy and the compassion and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ in the here and the now. So it's not just for later on, but it's for now. And this is how we grow in holiness. Not just through our prayer and our worship, which are essential to anything that we do, but also by our giving, our caring, to the point that we are able to do so. So that we're giving real glory and praise and thanks to the one who has given everything for us and gives everything ultimately to us. He's the one that comes to us again today in his word and in the sacrament of the altar in each of us who believe. And he comes to remind us that we are his citizens, we are his holy ones, and that we are invited to continue to travel the journey with him deeper and deeper into the love of God made flesh in us, the living members of his body, the living members of Christ's body. Because ultimately, this is how we live out the promise of Christ becoming one of us in everything except for sin, so that the human race could become again what God originally created us and called us to be. We participate in that. We help to bring it about by our living this faith, this gift in the here and the now according to his call and his promise.